Colossians chapter 3. We're right in the middle of a section where Paul is correcting the church in Colossae of some wrong philosophies that have started to and been trying to creep into the church, worldly philosophies that have been creeping into the church. The one that we looked at last week was legalism. You guys, uh, it, which, I mean, it's, legalism is always something that's trying to creep into the church. It's always something that's trying to creep into the hearts of believers. And we hit legalism pretty hard last week. And kept coming back to the thought of legalism versus Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. This thought. Legalism versus Colossians 2, 10, which says, and you are complete in him. Remember the legalism that would say, if I don't handle or I don't touch those things, it would give me a, a more of a right standing, a better right standing with God. And we looked at there is nothing you can refrain your life from or give your life to that can ever make you more complete than you are in Jesus Christ. And so it takes all of the praise away from us, what we do or do not handle or touch or do, and puts it all where it rightly should be, is the cross, the blood of Jesus that has saved us and cleansed us and given us right standing with the Father. Amen? Amen. And that's the fact. There's nothing that could add to. There's nothing that could make us any better than we are in Christ. So how do we do this? How do we stay in? How do we rely upon Jesus? How do we do this Christian life and stay in that place, apart from legalism, apart from my works, in that place of rightness with the Father through Christ? Well, he gave us that answer to a few verses even further back. Chapter 2, verse 6. Paul said, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And how do we receive him? By simple faith. By just trusting in what he did at the cross. It's, the, it's that acronym, KISS, right? You guys remember KISS? You, you guys have probably used it before. Keep it simple, saints. Right? I know what you were thinking. That was wrong. Keep it simple, saints. That as we walk by him, we walk by simple faith and trusting in what he's already done at the cross. And we keep our eyes upon him. This is how we walk. So let's, let's look really quickly at the last little section of chapter 2, kind of get a, our thoughts aligned with the, the thinking of Paul as we head into chapter 3. Look, look with me at verse 20, and we'll just read through this. Colossians 2.20, Therefore, Paul says, If you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Verse 23 really sums and wraps this up. It says, Paul says, These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. They have false humility, and they, they promote or encourage or cause neglect of the body but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. And Paul is making a very pointed statement and thought, and really philosophy. He's saying those are worldly philosophies. This is a godly philosophy that we should follow. And that philosophy is that legalism has these things there in verse 23. It makes you have the appearance of wisdom, but it's really self-imposed religion. It's, it's sort of false. It's fake. And it, and it causes false humility. Oh, woe is me. But you're actually in, in legalism, and this is one of the points we looked at last week, in legalism, who is it all about? Jesus? No, self. It's about my self-righteousness. It's about the things I don't do. I can't believe you would do that. Ew. You watch the Discovery Channel? Despicable. I can't believe you would do that. And I know that's a funny joke, but there are people like that. And that's, it's causing them to think they're better because of something they don't touch, they don't handle. 
and it causes, look what it says there at the, at the end of that or in the middle of verse 23, it causes the neglect of the body. You're all about yourself. You don't love others. The body is about loving others. And they're of no value. All of these efforts in and of your own strength are of no value against sin, the indulgences of the flesh. Whoa. So you step back from that and go, Paul, holy cannoli. You're saying you can't just try harder in your own strength and be a better Christian, and we can't. The, the focus of this section goes right back to verse 20. He says, therefore, if you died with Christ from those basic principles of the world. It's so important. What's he referring to? He's referring to back further in chapter 2 where he talked about baptism. It's that, it's that outward expression. We're going to have one. Is it next week? It's next Sunday. A week from today, we're going to have a baptism. Praise God that we're going to have a baptism where we just practice. We put into actual physical flesh, this motion to show that we are identifying with Christ. And you guys know what it means. You go down as into the grave and you come up a new creation, the old man dead, the new man rises with Christ in the resurrection power of Jesus. And this is what Paul's talking about. We got to have that old man die. Therefore, if you die with Christ, and he's going to go into, if you die with Christ, and then look at the very first section of verse 3. He says, if then you were raised with Christ. He, he fills that, I'm sorry, I said verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, Christ, completing this thought. And he starts this whole thought back in verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God. And this main point, this is the main point that we are to, to focus on and identify with. So as we're going through this, we're not thinking about philosophies, wrong philosophies or thinking. We're thinking about this, which is to die to self and to be living in the resurrection power of Jesus, the new person in Christ, when it comes to pleasing and serving and honoring God and the power to do these things for us, it's to live in the newness of life the resurrection power, and it's an important point. It's what this whole topic, this whole section we're going through is centered on, that resurrection power. We've been raised a new person in Christ. So right off the bat, I mean, it just begs the question, is this my life? Is it a new life in Christ? Or am I living to the old life, the old things? Well, let's check this text out. Chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Paul says, If then you were raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So Paul, in, in the context of what he's talking about, this whole section, he's saying, if you were raised with Christ, this should be your mind. He's kind of reminding us, Christians, if you were raised and you're living in this newness of life, this is what it should look like. This is what it should be about. And it goes against, remember, the Gnostic way of thinking. And there's a couple of things. I just want to remind you really quickly, this Gnostic way of thinking, the most popular way of thinking, which allowed provision for the flesh, was for the, the, them to say, God made everything, or I'm sorry, it was a lesser deity that made everything physical. Physical things are all evil, they're all bad, they're all wicked. Our body is bad and wicked, so what we do in the body is going to be bad and wicked, which is to rationalize sin. But our spirit has been saved by Jesus, so it's totally pure. So they're kind of compartmentalizing. We can still sin and do all those things to appease the flesh, and that's okay because we're supposed to, we're going to, but the Spirit has been cleansed by Jesus. Now, hopefully, as I even say that, you're thinking, no, that doesn't make sense. There should be some red flags going off. You, you, you know, it, <laughs> you could say you're a duck all day. You could quack like a duck all day. I don't know where I'm going with this, but it's, you know the analogy. It's, uh, you know the thing. Sorry, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that. I, I lost my train of, that, of thought. You could sleep in a garage. Does it make you a car? You could say you're a Christian, you could go to church. It doesn't make you 
someone who's walking pleasing to the Lord or who is born again living in resurrection power. The difference is in that our lives are going to have fruit that exemplifies the truth. They testify to the truth that I am a new creation in Christ. As we go through this section this morning, there's going to be, I think, a few things in this text that are going to cut our hearts. And we're going to hear them and go, man, I'm guilty of that. In fact, I was guilty of that this morning. Lord, and this is where it should bring us to, Lord, I need your saving grace every moment of my life. Just to be a real believing Christian. Okay, now, and, and and I... Needless to say, this is going to be a very practical section to show us practically how to live a life pleasing to God. So Paul starts out with this thought. If this is true in your life, then you have died to the old man and are alive in Christ. Then this is the evidence. Number one, you are going to seek those things which are above, which is to seek Christ, to seek the things where Christ is, Christ sitting at the right hand of God. And seek is a simple word. It just means to pursue, to search out those things which are Christ and which are where he is. So the question for us, for our lives is, Isaac, are you seeking after or pursuing Jesus and the things of him primarily in your life? Or maybe I should should say it like this. What am I seeking after primarily? And I think sometimes... We don't seek Jesus primarily. What's occupying our thought and our mind and our, you know, our whole being is often other things. And maybe, I don't know, now that, now, and nowadays, the, the day and age we live, maybe it's something that's coming in the mail. I, I, I'll, t- <laughs> I'll tell you a good one. I'll try to be as honest as I can. I shouldn't even say that. That sounds horrible. You know the thing. My, my, my son ordered a video game that's going to be here tomorrow. I'm kind of excited about this video game. I'm like, dude, this is kind of cool. I'm, I'm excited for you to get this video game so you can play it. And my wife looks at me. Oh, no, no, no I don't want to play it. Okay, maybe just a little bit. But I'll wait till you're asleep. No, but it's just one of those things in life. What preoccupies our mind? What is our heart set upon? And, and that we would have the heart that says, Lord, you know what? Forgive me. When I'm putting my attention, focus, affection towards other things than you, because as a a mark of a born-again, spirit-filled person is that our mind are set upon the things of him, or we seek those things. Then we go to the second thing, set your mind on the things above, and the opposite of that is not on the things of the earth. And, And let me just say, you guys know this, this is just some great Christian practical advice, absolute great advice. You want to get bummed out and frustrated and bitter in life? Just watch the news. Just focus on the things of earth. Just look at what's going on, and you'll be bummed out, guaranteed. You'll be, oh, I don't believe what they're doing, them, oh, you know, that kind of thing. And the antidote for that is what Paul gives us here. Man, set your mind on the things above. Did you know that, that the things above is our real home And I hope that's real in our lives. Heaven is my real home. Not this earth. Not the things of this earth, but heaven. And man, when you start thinking of the hope that we have and the future that we have and the glory we have, all these things on the earth, they just fade away. They're nothing compared to when we arrive. Ah, thank you, Lord. So that we would set our mind on things above. Then he says there in verse 3, For you died... And your life is hidden with Christ in God. I just have to ask myself again, is this statement true in my life? And again, honestly, all too often, the statement would read for me, is Christ died, which is truth, but my life is lived for me. And I I think to myself, God, may it be that I have died and my life is hidden with Christ in God. That when people see me and they see anything good in me, it's not me. It's my life hidden in Christ. It's him. It's his faithfulness. It's his goodness. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. And you know, 
I, I think to myself, often when they do see good in us, it's because we are living a crucified life, not for self, for other people. Verse 4, and Paul goes on, he gives us one last thing to think on in this section, and it's our future. Verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. He's talking about the second coming and how awesome that's going to be. When Jesus comes to basically destroy, vanquish the enemy, we get to come with him as part of his army. How amazing is that? We got... We got God's back. And let me just tell you, he doesn't need <laughs> our help, you know, but we get to be a part of it. You know what it's really like is when my son, Ethan, who was playing the drums this morning, when he was a little kid, I, I would go out and mow the lawn, and he had like one of those bubble lawnmower things, you know, and he'd follow behind me, and we'd be mowing the lawn. Was he doing anything? No. Did I need him? No. Was he enjoying it? Oh, are you kidding? Absolutely. It's the same thing when we come back with him. Is he going to need our help? No. Are we going to be doing anything? No. Are we going to enjoy it? Oh, it's going to be so awesome to watch our Lord in front of us vanquish the enemies with a word from his mouth. Oh, sweet, sweet victory. And we get to go, we mowed the lawn. And God's just going to go, I love you guys. But I kind of want to back up to the, to the beginning of that verse, to this fact that Paul breaks to us. And just the way that he says it, it, it doesn't really capture your attention, but the truth is Christ is our life. Man, and again, I come back to that thought. Christ is our life. Is he my life? Is Christ our life? I mean, obviously, he holds everything together. We already saw that in chapter 1. He is God. He is our life. Without him, life would not happen. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be breathing. But also, may it be true in our lives. Jesus, when people look at us, may they see you. God, please, may they see you and not me. So continuing on now, Paul gets really practical. Verse 5, he says, Therefore, because of all these things, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So, again, running along this line, this vein of thinking, that we are reckoning the old man dead and buried with Christ, and we are walking in the newness of life, being a new creation in Christ. Paul says in verse 5, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Which is an interesting thought. Now, he doesn't say, hey, you know what you should do is you should counsel your members that are on earth, that you should try to rehab your members that are on earth. You should try to work on them. He says we are to put them to death. That old sinful man. How do we put it to death? We take it to the cross. <laughs> the power and the work of the cross is absolutely matchless. It's absolutely amazing that when we come to that cross... We bring all of the, the, the sins that may happen in our life, but we also bring our pride and our arrogance and our wrong thinking and our wrong hearts to that cross. We let go of all of them at the foot of the cross, and we're free. We basically unburden ourselves from all of those things at the cross. It's where the power of God into salvation is. And I, I personally, I know it's true in my own life, but I believe that Christians in our day and age don't come to the cross often enough. Yeah, we'll pray and say some prayers and be frustrated with ourselves and our flesh and try to work on it a little bit. But we don't just come to the cross, reckon ourselves dead to ourselves and alive again in Christ. It's so important for us. That's how we do it. We bring it to the cross. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. So he gives us this list. Now, this list really is referring primarily to sexual conduct. It's non-God-honoring sexual conduct. First one there is fornication, which is the Greek word porneia, which is where we get our word pornography. 
which is a broad word and specifically means any sexual intimacy, specifically intercourse with outside of God's you know, place for it, which is marriage, okay? Any extramarital uh, sexual intimacy, sexual intercourse, which includes premarital. And I've never had this happen to me uh, actually like in my life, but a couple of the commentaries that I went through, they were dealing with people who said, well, we know that you can't commit adultery. It says that in the Bible, but the Bible doesn't say anything about premarital sex. Eh, wrong answer. God covers that. And this word specifically covers that. The Bible is clear. The Bible is also really clear that men and women are designed by God for sexual intimacy, which has manifold purpose. And God lays it out that when there's an an, an intimacy that is God honoring and it's in the place where it's supposed to be, it's going to be healthy, it's going to be good, it's going to be beneficial for marriage, there are so many blessings from it that God is, is implemented in. But when intimacy is outside of God's place for marriage, it actually flips on its head, becomes completely disruptive. It, come, it becomes disruptive mentally. It becomes uh, something that will dull your life, something that will take you in a direction that you don't want to go. But the Bible is clear on what a God-honoring marriage is. The Bible specifically says, one man and one woman and the two become one flesh. There's a couple of things that are exclusive about that. Number one is the number of people in the marriage. One man, one woman, period. The other thing is the kinds of individuals that are in the marriage. One man... One woman. And of course, the world today wants to redefine marriage and has redefined marriage. Not according to God's way. Not according to God's plan. I thank God that we get to live according to His word. I thank God that the world, what the world does, although on one sense it matters, on another sense it doesn't matter because I'm going to follow God's word. You know, I, I, I had a, a brother, that a dear brother, I love, really love, who as soon as marijuana was legalized and he found out it was legalized, he went, I'm a little bit scared about this because that's, that was it, man. That was my drug of choice. And I said, the cool thing is, it doesn't matter what the world legalizes. We're going to follow God. And he went, that's right. Yeah, just a little reminder. It doesn't matter what the world says or what the world does. We're going we're gonna to honor and follow God. And guess what? The reason that we get to honor and follow God is for our own protection, safety, and enrichment of our life. I don't know if there's anyone here that can testify and say, I've done marriage God's way, and it's worth it. It's a blessing. Man, thank you, God, for your word being true. Amen? And then there's probably a whole bunch of us, too, that can say, and I've done it not God's way, and that was a mess. It was a shipwreck because the word of God is true. Okay, now, so, so that's the word fornication. I covered that kind of a lot. Um, but knowing the heart of man and God knowing that men are going to, and women, all of them, are going to say, yeah, but we did a whole bunch of stuff, but we never had sex. He went on and said, well, I'll cover that too. The next word there is uncleanness, meaning sexual uncleanness, which is another broad term referring to any type of, Pretty, basically anything else that you would do uh, that's sexual that is not where it's supposed to be. So, you know, it covers the, the people that say, hey, man, we did everything but sex, so we're okay. God says, no, any sexual uncleanness outside of marriage, and he covers that. Then he goes on into passions, which is to have that wrongly placed passion, including lust. He goes on to evil desire, which is kind of continually thinking of wickedness, of, of something that is lustful that God hasn't planned for our life, evil desire. And then he goes on to the last one, which is covetousness, which I believe definitely includes a sexual way because it's in this, in this list. And, you know, we are instructed throughout the word not to covet our, our neighbor's wife. Um, and these types of things, they're just... It's, it's written, it's what God has put in here. And it includes thinking or coveting, desiring something, anything that is not your own. Now, I, I can't remember, but in this, in this 
example of these things, I'm sorry, these list of these things that God is warning us not to be partakers of, one of them in there, again, I'm, forgive me for not remembering which one it was, one of these words in here has the idea of taking, you're being in it to take, being in it to get what you can get out of the relationship, which is the opposite of being in it to give, the opposite of being in a marriage to bless and to serve and to love is to be in a, in a place to take in what you can get out of it, which so often is what the world is doing when it comes to anything sexual. What can I get? Taking and taking without the other in mind. This is quite the opposite of what Paul told us before, seeking those things that are above, those things that are holy, that are pure, to seek these things that are a perversion. And of course, when I, when I look at these things and I look at the, the perversion, Satan would love to, and I would say, I look around the world today and say, is doing a pretty good job of perverting intimacy, right? Are you guys with me on that? He's doing a huge job of, of perverting, of twisting intimacy, of twisting sexual relationships. And I think one of the biggest reasons that he probably is doing, is doing it is because of verse 6. Look at verse 6. Paul says, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And so if the enemy can get mankind to fall in these areas, he knows they're going to be judged. He knows they're going to be judged because of these things. When I read verse 6, I, I, I cannot help but look around. Now, I used to look around at our world and say, we're not quite there. We're not quite to as the days of Noah. Nowadays, I look around and think, we're a little past the days of Noah. I mean, we are just walking around, and the thought, the heart behind the whole thing is just pride, and I know me, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and I don't care about anybody else. And I, I, I look at it, and I think, my goodness, the only thing, the only difference that we have is in our day and age, we have the church. We have that restraining force with the Holy Spirit. We have the difference. Noah didn't have that. But if you took the church out of the way, what you would have is what the Bible described. So many people only thinking about evil all the time. And I just go, man, we are headed down that road. And I don't know if you know this or not, but we're on the express lane, right? We're not just gradually heading there. This is, this is getting crazy. Thank God we don't fix our eyes on that. Thank God we fix our eyes on him. And Paul kind of, he gives us that hint there in verse 7. He says, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. And I love how Paul puts it here. It's past tense. It's something that doesn't mark any longer the life of a follower of Christ, the life of a believer in Christ. We don't walk in those ways. It kind of reminds me of the book of 1 John. As John does the same thing, talking about the things we used to practice but no longer remain in those things. We're children of God. Now, when I look at this list of things, this isn't something we practice. This isn't something that we're doing. We might tragically fall or choose to sin in one of these things, but they're not the pattern of our lives. They're not the habitual things in our lives. We've replaced those old habits with better habits, with godly habits. We've replaced those old habits with walking with Jesus, with being in the Word, with living in prayer, with practicing being in the presence of God and in fellowship with one another. So that old stuff is to be put to death. We're no longer to walk in it. We're no longer to practice in it. And now we move on here in our text in verse 8 to a different list of things that we still fall prey to, but we also need to change. He puts it, Paul puts it a little bit different. We don't put them to death, but it still has, it carries the same idea where to put them off. So let's look at verses 8 and 9. Paul says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth, and do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. So Paul gives us this new list, and he tells us where to put it off. And the word really simply kind of in the Greek, put off, it just means it's 
changing your clothes. You take it off, you put it somewhere else, and you don't bring it with you. I don't know how many of you guys bring around some clothes with you, just in case. Listen, the just in case days, well, in my house, they're still there. So you bring a diaper bag just in case of poopies in the pants, right? Bring an extra change of clothes. Those days for us, though, mature, they're gone. We don't take those around with us. And so this is the idea that Paul is saying, you put these off, you put them away from yourself. You disconnect from these things. And he gives us a list of things that we as Christians, as human Christians, may fall prey to, but we are to be aware of putting them off. So look, look with me here. He starts with, number one, anger, which doesn't have the idea of like explosive anger, or flying off the handle. That's the next one. This definition of anger has the idea of like stewing in anger, remaining angry angry and having an attitude of anger towards someone else. One of the definitions I looked up, it said it, it said it like this, like fruit growing full of or swelling with juice. So it's like this ripening with anger inside of you, just ugh, swelling with anger, which, and you guys know this, right? To be angry and to live a life like that with bitterness in your heart, it's like drinking poison trying to hurt somebody else. We shouldn't be given to this type of anger and holding on to bitterness, but we should forgive. We should walk in forgiveness, practicing forgiveness. The next one is wrath, which has more of the idea of explosive temper, um, a rage, like a heat, fervency, boiling. Um, and I think of, I don't know why, the teapot that screams when it's hot enough, right? Right? Um, but sort of flying off the handle, and we're to put off this kind of, of wrath and anger. And of course, this kind of wrath is all around us. I, think, I can't think of you know, going somewhere, driving somewhere, and not seeing uh, somebody get angry, or maybe me getting angry. I don't know, but it's this type of thing. I, in fact, I, I'm, I was probably not all the way there, but leaning there this morning. My microphone kept making that noise again, and I, went, I just told everybody, I'd like to throw this right out into the alley. I'm not going to do that, but of course, that would have been this, this, this type of wrath, which is a sin. Paul says, put it off. Malice. Malice is the next one, which is wickedness. It's the desire to injure. It's not a shame to break the law. It's to, to be okay to have lawlessness. So it's kind of like an intent, right? Wicked intent. Put that off. The next one, blasphemy. And blasphemy, the way it's used here, isn't to blaspheme God. It's really, it's talking about talking bad about other people. So blaspheming other people, defaming their character to other people. Paul says, put that off as a Christian. Don't do that. Filthy language. We're not to swear. I mean, this is simple. We're not to swear. We're not to have speech that is dishonoring to God. You know, I, I told the, the story um, first service because there's sort of a modern thinking in church that's like, God doesn't care if you swear. Well, we're reading it right here. But I remember hanging out with the gal. We were at a different church. I was hanging out with her, and, and um, she said a cuss word just right there on the front steps of the church. And I must have shown on my face because she looked at me and went, oh, 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 it's okay. Our pastor doesn't care if we cuss. And I went, Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I didn't say this. I'm thinking, well, thank you. I just didn't know it was safe. This is a safe cussing zone. <clears throat> and really, I mean, that's like the sarcastic thought, right? Because really what I'm thinking is, who cares what your pastor thinks? You need to honor Jesus. It should care what he, we should care what he thinks about our language, about our conduct, not what your pastor thinks or not what someone somewhere has said is okay. It goes right back to that rule of the law. Like, uh, uh, it, it's okay if other people are okay with doing sinful things. It's not okay for me. I, I'm going to walk after the word of God. So, again, one of those things, putting away filthy language. And the last one there, um, or second to last, not to lie to one another. And, of course, we are not to, we are definitely not to lie to one another. And I think when I think of lying, and that, that, that is the last one there. When I think of lying, I think of uh, who the father of lies is, right? We're, we represent him when we lie, um, not representing our true father. So we're to put these things off. We're to be separated from these things. We're to take off that old man. 
And I just have one more thing to mention, uh, and I'm going to mention it one more time. There was a group of people professing to be believers in the church of Colossae who believed that doing these things was okay with God because it was part of our sin nature, the physical part, and that somehow the inner spiritual man uh, was not the physical man or connected to. And again, I, I just think of the words of Jesus. He said, you will know a tree by its fruit. So he's saying you'll know what's inside, what kind of person they are by the fruit that comes out of their life. Verse 10, he says... And have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So Paul, he flips this over. He flips this kind of upside down and he says, now you take that off and you put on, really what he's saying here, put on Christ. Put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to to the image of him who created him. Now, really quickly, I just want to say this, and I, I, I'm thankful for this. He's saying, who is renewed in knowledge? First of all, where are we going to get the knowledge of Jesus, of God? Primarily the word of God. We're going to get it from reading the Bible, from being in the Bible. And this idea of renewed, I, I like this idea. And when I think of being renewed, I think of, it jumps and in my heart, my mind, is that I need to be daily renewed. I can't just come to the Lord once a month, spend some time with Him, and think I put enough in the account that the rest of the month is going to be great, smooth sailing. I need to be renewed daily. I need to come to Him daily. I need to start and finish with my mind being renewed, being changed according to, and it says here, the image of Him who created Him. That's Jesus it's to become like Jesus by beholding Jesus, by getting into the Word, by putting Christ on us, being conformed into His image. Now, when I think of this, I also think there's no doubt that Paul reference, is referencing Genesis, the creation of man. We are created in His image. There's been a fall but we need to continue that direction of being renewed to be in the image, to be the image bearer, the light bearer of Christ. Amen? So closing here, last verse, verse 11 as we wrap up, and I want to ask Beth to come up as we close and we kind of ponder these things. Verse 11, Paul says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew nor circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Amen? <laughs> I love this. Because really what Paul is saying is it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your kind of life. If you are in Christ, then you have all and are in all. We are, and it goes back to that thought of the cross. The ground is level at the foot <laughs> of the cross. You can come to that cross with more wealth than anyone in the world. The ground is level. The slave could be standing next to you and the ground is level at the cross. Both complete in Christ. Complete. Remember what complete means? You can't add any to it. Both complete in Christ. And so Paul gives us this list. Neither Jew nor Greek there's no ethnicity, there's no nationality that one's better. He says, Jew or circumcised. Listen, there's no religious system. It's Christ. There's no, there's no thing that you could do in your flesh that would make you more right with God than standing before Jesus and pleading His blood. He says barbarian or Scythian. This one's an interesting one because a barbarian was somebody who the Greeks couldn't understand their language. And so they would just go, oh, well, that's a barbarian. They're lesser. And a Scythian was the less, the least of the barbarians. So it's not like an opposite thing. It's like if you're the least of the least of the least, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You have everything you need in Christ. And then he says, neither a slave nor free. Again, back to that thought. But Christ is all and in all. I have to say this. I firmly believe there is no place for all of mankind 
like Christianity, like what we have in Christ. All of the walls that men have put up that would separate men, categorize men economically or socially or ethnically or nationality, those have been devastated and demolished, ground to to dust at the cross. And so what we have is (laughs) the true melting pot. What we have is what it was supposed to be like in our nation, but can't quite get there because they don't have Jesus. What we have is a family in Christ, and it's a level, equal family, where we think of one another as more highly than ourselves, where we love one another. And and you know what? We're going to mess up in this. Thank God for His grace but that we'd be real Christians, real believers, loving one another. I I just have to say once again as we wrap up, I am so thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for you guys, for the family, the newness of life that we have. I'm so thankful for what he's done and what he came to do and that he came and finished it at the cross. Let's all stand together. I just want to encourage us to come to that cross once again. We're going to sing just a little bit here for a moment, but I want you to to picture in your mind that cross. Like, close your eyes. Picture the cross before you. And whatever it is in your life right now that's burdensome, that's heavy, that's destructive, whether it's sin or wrong thinking or wrong philosophy, unforgiveness, Whatever it is, lay it at the foot of that cross. Let go of it and be free in Christ. As we sing this song, just let Jesus back in. Just get right once again with the, with the creator of the universe through the blood of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we thank you for that cross that makes us whole, that allows the Spirit to live in us, that allows us to walk in the newness of life, not according to the old man, but according to that resurrection power, the Spirit of God. So we thank you this morning for what you've done for us. We give you the praise. We thank you for the hope, the peace, the fulfillment that we have in life. It's because of your goodness. So we just give you the praise. We just give you the honor. God, you truly are good. You truly have set us free. We can testify this morning that he who the Son sets free, oh Lord, we are free indeed. And it's all because of you. It's Christ who is all in all. 
So we praise you this morning in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. 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 God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. I hope you've been reminded this morning of who you are in Christ. You are complete in Him.